Bienvenidos a la Universidad de California, Los Ángeles. Yeah. Yeah. Also known as UCLA. UCLA. Uh, UCLA. Uh, uh, we're here for a very special event, uh, uh, an important recognition of someone that played and continues to play an important part in Chicano history. Uh, you've had a slideshow, those of you that were able to see it, and uh, it goes back in time. Uh, it took me back to uh, the mid-60s, uh, and uh, I was also able to recognize some of the people in the, in the video. Uh, we are opening an exhibit here, a display, uh, that is part of the collection um, for Sal Castro. The Sal Castro collection is coming to UCLA Chicano Studies Research Center. Uh, you don't know how uh, I feel about that. You really don't know how. Uh, it's uh, very special for me, uh, having known Sal, uh, but I never pressured him. How can you pressure Sal Castro? <laughs> I never pressured him. Uh, it was always there in my thinking. We need to have his collection here at uh, LA, we, at, at the major university in Los Angeles, although he went to USC football games. Uh, and he tailgated with all those Trojans. Uh, but it's coming here. And it was uh, uh, one of his wishes that his collection of materials come here. Now, I've asked the musicians to come up, at conjunto, to come up and sit at the front because music was also very much a part of South Castro's life. Every Chicano Youth Leadership Conference, there was music, there were musicians, mariachis, conjuntos. Every conference, there was music. Uh, it was part of his. It was part of his cultural being and part of his expression of life, and uh, the students felt it too. Now, his legacy has touched many, many people. Some of them are in his in this room, uh, but he was especially. Um, he especially felt and reacted to his students going on to college and those young people that attended the CYLC going to the college and then returning and telling them that, yes, uh, Mr. Castro, and that's the way you identified him. That's the way you recognized him. That's the way you talked to the man. Mr. Castro, I did as you told me. I did as you suggested, very strongly suggested, <laughs> that I go to college. And if you were a young Chicana, you said, my boyfriend didn't, uh, tell me what to do, my mother didn't tell me what to do, my father didn't tell me what to do, I did it. I did the right thing for me and I did the right thing for my community. I went to college, I graduated, and I went on to be a professional person, to contribute to my community, but when he really, really was most satisfied was when that person that came back and told him that he'd gone on to college when that young person told him, I became a teacher. I became a teacher. And you're gonna hear from some of his students to today, uh, later on. Uh, some of us are not so young anymore, but uh, we've gone on to do a number of things uh, to contribute to, um, to our community. Uh, now, I wanna take you back uh, to 1968. And this was actually the first time that I met Sal Castro. I was an undergraduate student here at UCLA, a member of uh, United Mexican American Students, UMAS. And it was the precursor to METRA. And uh, we formed in 1967, and in 68, we had Sal Castro come in and we met at Kirchhoff Hall, room 417. Room 417, beautiful room wooden chairs, huge wooden uh, table. And he was there. And we thought, oh, we're gonna, we're gonna determine what is gonna happen. We're college students, we're the intelligentsia of the movement. <laughs> no, 
<laughs> that didn't happen. That didn't happen. He came and overwhelmed us with his ideas, with his plans, and what he wanted to do on behalf not only of the group of students that he brought with him, he brought several high school students, and he always had his, his group, right, of students, high school students. Always traveled with high school students, his high school students, to wherever he went to a meeting. Well, he had about four or five students there that day. We were overwhelmed. We were nowhere <coughs> near what Sal Castle was thinking and planning to do. Nowhere near. And uh, you can read about that in the book, uh, that was uh, written by uh, Sal Castro and uh, Mario Garcia, a, a faculty member at UC Santa Barbara. It's a book that everyone should read now, and it's available, so in that way his legacy continues. But he's also on film. As you walk outside, the display case has a monitor, and in that monitor you'll see a film that was, uh, it's a documentary that was prepared and, and released in 1995. It was produced by Susan Racho. Susan Racho was a student here in 1968. Susan Racho produced that film in 1995. Move forward again to 2005, 2006, HBO film, Walkouts, produced by Montezuma Esparza, also a student in 1968 here at UCLA. There is a connection between Sal Castro and UCLA. Obviously at that program here at Campbell Hall for high school kids, what was it called? Upward bound. Upward, bound. Upward, bound. Upward bound. Upward bound. So we would see him in Campbell Hall. He was there. But more important, uh, this campus had a tumultuous 1968. But it was significant for all students of color because changes in 1968 allowed, allowed us to establish the Ethnic Studies Research Centers here at UCLA, the four of them, including the Mexican American Cultural uh, Center, which became the Chicano Studies Center, which became the Chicano Studies Research Center. You're sitting in that center now. And it may not have exist today if it hadn't been for community members coming onto campus to help the students to mobilize and to pressure the Chancellor's Office and all the other powers that be in this institution for change. Ethnic studies did not exist at the university level. 1969, this center was established. And one of those people from the community that came onto the campus to help the students create this center was Sal Castro. And I have the pictures to prove it. <laughs> now, in uh, 1970, a four artists, four Chicano artists created a mural called Chicano History. And We have a poster of that 1970 mural, all right? It was painted in 1970, and it was on the third floor of Campbell Hall. In talking to, uh, to various photographers about this display, and uh, in my attempt to get uh, photos, uh, images from the 60s and 70s on Sal Castro, I talked to George Rodriguez was very, very cautious about his images going out and about. But he loaned me one image, and it's out on the display case, and I wanted to show it to you now because it hasn't <coughs> been exhibited outside of this display today. It's a picture taken in 1970 when Anthony Quinn visited UCLA. Anthony Quinn visited UCLA, and here is Sal Castro. And this is the mural behind him, the mural was behind him. Third floor, Campbell Hall. He visited, Sal Castro did, visited visited uh, the apartment, the center that he helped to create. Now, I'm not going to take up any more time uh, reminiscing. Um, I can only tell you that we're very grateful. 
appreciative of the family uh, making this donation of such important artifacts of our history to this, uh, to this center and allowing us to provide that collection to future scholars. Once it is established as a collection here for scholars to access, you can believe that people outside of Mario Garcia, you can believe that graduate students and undergraduate students will be accessing that collection and continuing to write about Sal Castro's part in the history of the Chicano movement of the 60s and educational revolutions that occurred subsequent to that, that he was involved in. It didn't stop with 1968. It didn't stop with the Chicano movement. It didn't end with our Chicano community. It didn't end there. He affected all students, all students. His love for life and educational reform reflects that. So I want to leave you with that. And I want, let's see, uh, I was going to ask uh, if uh, uh, Jimmy had arrived yet. Jimmy Castro, we're gonna have several members of his family coming in. Now you all understand that we're at UCLA and this is the hardest institution to get to. <laughs> the most difficult place to find parking. And of course the 405 is being worked on. Uh, now, and again, We'll be bringing up members of the family at a later time. Uh, I want to ask uh, for uh, two of Sal Castro's uh, past students. One is a student from um, his Belmont High School class of 1978, and another is from his Belmont High School class of 1989. These are both women, both Chicanas that have gone on, graduated from college, just as Sal Castro demanded that they do. <laughs> moved on into the professional ranks and have been working on behalf of the community since then. Uh, Rena Bruti is over here. She's a principal at Wilmington Middle School in LA Unified School District. And uh, Robin Avelar Lasalle, Dr. Avelar Lasalle. Uh, uh, this is another point. It's very important. Sal Castro always referred to his students with their titles. Dr. Avila Lasalle. And uh, she is a chief executive officer of the Principles of Change Foundation, a nonprofit educational organization, and I see her in many of the schools. So I'm gonna ask the, the two uh, women to come up and to make their presentation. Thank you. tapes and that's what we walked into class with and then he would proceed to take role and for me the first day of class he said Robin Avelar and he said it very Spanish pronounced Robin Avelar and um, I said hello here but I never pronounced my name like that before um, in school my name was Robin Avelar and Lord forbid I make a mistake and say it that way in front of him. He would correct us. In fact, he would correct everybody. Chris <laughs> was not Chris, he was Cristobal, and he reminded him that his name was Cristobal, not Crystal Ball, the way his teachers would pronounce it. And there was always a smoky in class, I don't know why, but his name is really Jesus, and so he would talk to him with his name. And we had um, Millie Zapata. Her name was Millie Zapata. Forevermore, he would change her name to Emiliana Chancla. <laughs> <laughs> we couldn't get away with anything with Mr. Castro. Um, that, that was my first encounter with my teacher, Mr. Castro. 
Um, by the time I started at Belmont High School, he was out of the classroom and serving more in a capacity of counselor, mentor, father, and anything he could get himself um, to do. But one of my fondest memory, if you're familiar with Belmont, uh, when I went to high school there, it was a, a three track school. So, and the reason they had to have tracks was because it was, they had over 5,000 students. And my experience with him was that although you had 5,000 students on that campus, when he talked to you, you felt that you were the only student that he was helping. And even when he uh, was public speaking and he would talk to the, uh, the student body, somehow you always felt that he was speaking directly at you and making sure that you understood his message and making sure that you knew what you had to do in order to move ahead. And so many, many, many times, often, often, um, we'd see him walking down the hallway, you're going to class, you're, you know, you're in between periods, and it would never fail that he would stop you and say, Mika, did you go to the uh, conference that I told you to? Did you finish that? So he would always catch up with the things that he told you to do or give us new homework <laughs> to make sure that you know, we were following through. So on this particular time, I know that I'm walking down the hallway and he said, hey, Mika, um, you need to meet me at the library after school today. There are some colleges uh, that are gonna be visiting our campus and they wanna see you. They, they specifically wanna talk to you. Okay, so I showed up. Uh, no, they had no idea who I was. <laughs> but I guarantee you that I applied to every university that was there on that day. So that was his way of making sure that you follow through. He always had a unique way to support you and guide you. And although um, you feel that you were the only one that was there and that existed, I just feel very privileged to have been at least one of the millions that were there that he helped and support. And I can honestly tell you this, um, I would not be where I am right now if it wasn't for that. Oh, we're not done. You're not, get, you're not eating early. Not even <laughs> so what we'd like to do is to introduce this next segment um, and try and get you to know our teacher in a little bit of a way of the way we know him by going through a bit of a chronology. Now, we are fake. And the reason yeah. we are fake is because his story starts in the early 60s. I was born in 1961. <laughs> so when it says early 60s, the reason I know about all that is because I read about him in school, um, in class because he gave us an assignment to read about him. So we learned, <laughs> <laughs> we learned about him. So, but there are people here in the room that were there then that we will be pointing out and introducing. Um, but um, as we read about it and we heard about it, he started in the early 60s and he was uh, a famous teacher, very young, very cute um, mm -hmm. teacher at Lincoln High School. And I think there's some people here who were there when he was there. Um, and as we understand it, and he told us this too, even right out the gate as a young teacher, he was already angry. And uh, he was angry for many years. And he was angry because of the tracking that was going on in school. Fear not, we don't do that anymore. <laughs> I have to say that with a straight face. Um, it's illegal now. Mm -hmm. But back then, <laughs> we did it legally. Now we just do it illegally. But um, there was the college bound track and the non-college bound track, and you know who wasn't in the college bound track, and he was very angry about that. And uh, would openly, um, without fear of retribution for his professional safety, speak to that as often as he could be heard. So what do you do when you have injustice? you make sure that you begin to um, ensure that future generations do not have to deal with what you, you're dealing with or that your students are dealing with. So in the, 19, in the early 1960s, they began the Chicano Youth Leadership Conference where students, and again, you know, as a, a fake, I wasn't there, but um, other people were. And these are, are students that began to question 
what was going on in the schools, that what was going on was not fair. They needed better educational programs. They needed counselors. They needed um, representation, administrators that would speak their language that could help them and support their needs. So these are just a few of the things, smaller classrooms, clean bathrooms, clean schools, places where students could go and feel that they were uh, protected and that they will and that they felt respected. So in the in the organization of the Chicano New Leadership Conference began the conversations about we want something better. So in 68, we have a group of students, um, a courageous group of students who for Mr. Castro they were his niños héroes, who often, often, and if you hear his speeches, you'd see what passion and how much love he had for those individuals. Now a little bit of the history, um, in 1968, three years prior, there was the Watts riots. And so 36 people were hurt, killed during those riots. So three years later, you have students that are saying enough is enough. We want something better for us, something better for our community, and certainly something better for our future. So part of his pride and his love for this group of students was because they understood the danger and they understood what could happen. But regardless of that, they could not stand one more day without with what was going on. So we do have some people here. Um, I'd like to introduce Paul Cristomo, please, Chrysostomo, is it please? And if there's anyone else here that was um, there in 68, if you could uh, please let us know. Thank you, thank you. And uh, I know this is very hard for her, but she is the Niños Edwards, and she is what we look um, up to and who we want to you know, emulate and, and, and be like. So I'm very proud to be in the same room as she is. And I know Robin is too. So tell us who we want to be when we grow up. <laughs> very special to us. So you know, Mr. Castro was on his way to pick up his date to go chaperone the prom, and he got picked up instead by the police. He was going to pick up his hot chick. And um, <laughs> Sitting in purple? he never made it to the prom because they arrested him, and he was charged with 36 counts of conspiracy to overthrow the government or something. Mm -hmm. Some felony that had charges of 30 years to life. He wasn't even 30 years old, I don't think. He was just barely 30, 30 34 30 years old. Mm -hmm. um, and so he was arrested and jailed. And you know, when um, you get arrested, you lose your credentials for teaching. So he was stripped of his credentials, stripped of his job. Um, mm -hmm. And he and 12 others were jailed and indicted very serious, very scary times. And the question was, did he conspire to overthrow the government to incite riots and such, or did he inspire a group of people, um, a group of students to uh, get in line with the times, which was to express their democratic right to civil disobedience and to express their, their right to demand a better quality of education and better opportunities. And in the end, we're happy to say he was um, set free, the charges were dropped, uh, but he didn't get his job back. And it took community outrage. And, and I tell you, the people who were there, Paula's first here on the list, equal to Charlotte Castro, who's here too, as well as, um, other people who are here who were there at the time, and they'll say it was a horrible experience to work with the Board of Education and LA Unified to get them to overturn their decision, the firing. Um, they actually had to sit in and not leave the boardroom for a week. a week. That's one smelly boardroom. Well, <laughs> if you look at the second poster, the, the one to the right of the red frame, you'll see a picture of Mr. Castro being lifted on the shoulders of students and community. 
that was the moment after the board did a roll call vote to reinstate him. Um, so that's a, that was an amazing moment. And it's in the video that's playing in the display. Um, so he was reinstated. And the district, uh, well, the state gave him back his credential. The district gave him back his job. Oh, except that they transferred him to four schools in about three months. Mm -hmm. So he moved from place to place to place to place, a little bit of harassment going on, until he finally landed, thank goodness for us, at B, 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 L. <laughs> I'll break out into the song, the fight song right now, if you're not careful. Um, so uh, he landed at, at Belmont High School. 78 was the year I graduated. I'm gonna tell you, now 78, if you count from 68, is 10 year anniversary. So we go to his class and Mr. Castro has us do a research project. First research project of my entire educational career. Never had to do a research paper. Um, so Mr. Castro would take us outside and have a desk outside the classroom and one at a time call us out give us a list of topics that we got to pick from. So he sat me down conference style, showed me the list, and showed me what I picked. <laughs> <laughs> if you're laughing, you know Mr. Castro. And I picked the walkouts, which at that time I thought was a dance move, the walkouts. Doesn't it sound like something? Walk it out, something like that. Um, and then he gave me a book, um, Rudy Acuna's book, and, and other resources that were not part of the library collection at the time and had me do the paper. And when I started reading the book, I was like, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, <gasps> that's my teacher, that's my teacher. Um, so that's how we learned about Mr. Castro because we wouldn't hear about it in, in school. Just a little tidbit. So af having read about it and having read about these, these famous people in the book, Paula Crisostomo and Company, and they were just, you know, fantastic figures to us, to our class, we decided that we should have a 10 year anniversary of the walkouts. Yes, we should. And we read that they planned in the park under trees. So we went and planned in Echo Park under the trees because we wanted to do what we read they had done. And um, we read they had buttons, so we made buttons. So there's a button outside in the display case of the 10 year Walk anniversary of the walkouts, 1968-1978. It's a beautiful button we made up by hand. You know, you get blisters making it in the machine, an old-fashioned machine. And um, so the day came, and we had read how they said, walk out, walk out. Have you seen the movie? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we, so we had a time and a date, and we were gonna walk out, and we had it all planned, and it's time to walk out, walk out, and we started to walk out. And on the flats of Belmont High School, there's this big grounds area with buildings all around, we looked up and there were snipers. Ooh. Somebody told, I think I know who it is. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so there were snipers on the roof with guns, real guns, pointing at us all in riot gear. And my mind flashed oh, back 10 years thinking, oh my gosh, the Paulas and company of that time saw that and kept walking. We saw that. <laughs> put our tail between our legs and went right back to class. I did not have the courage, nor did anybody else, to walk out. And I'll tell you, I was so ashamed of myself. So ashamed. When I had history class, again, fifth period, I went to Mr. Castro and I just bowed my head. I said, I'm so sorry. He didn't really know. He was inspiring us. He wasn't conspiring with us. And uh, I'm so sorry. We couldn't do it. We couldn't do it. And he said, Mija, don't worry. I'm Miha too, you're Miha, we were all Miha. Don't worry, he said, the time for fighting on the outside is over. You need to get on the inside. Go to college, get your bachelor's, get your master's, and get your doctorate. Get yourself inside the system and then fight. And um, that's exactly what I did, what Mirna did and what so many of us did. Thank you to Mr. So CYLC, Chicano Youth Leadership Conference, this is where we are now. And um, I did not attend the conference, but I've been a participant, a volunteer at the conference for many, many years. And 
that is exactly the message that we convey at the conference. Students have to go, and I'll tell you, they, they show up on that Friday, Friday afternoon, Friday morning, they show up, they don't wanna be there. They wanna go back home, we take away their phone, so they definitely don't wanna be there. <laughs> but somehow, a transformation happens over the weekend that by the time Sunday afternoon comes, they don't wanna go back on those buses, they don't wanna go back home. They wanna stay and continue to plan and continue to talk to see how is it or what is it that they need to do to be successful. And they learn just an incredible amount of information within a, a, a short weekend that they learn about cultura, about our cultura, our music, about who we are and our history. And it's about our responsibility to ensure that we go to college, that we graduate, that we get our advanced degrees, because ultimately we have a bigger responsibility, and that is to come back and give back to those who are left behind. Give back to those students that are right, right behind you. So throughout the weekend, and if you can see here in the display, we also have some pictures of some of the events. On Saturday, we have a huge event for the college fair. So they, they have an idea of what schools they want to attend. This are um, an opportunity for them to have conversations about what it takes or what they need. Um, many of our students do have the skills and they have the classes, but they don't know the how. They, don't, they haven't made those connections. So the university students who are volunteers at the conference become their mentors. And, and it's a great, again, an opportunity for them to continue to learn about who they are and about their responsibility because it doesn't stop there. We must continue, we must continue his work and we must continue his legacy now. So the model of the conference revised is this. It's no stand men, so school to college and graduate. And that's only after beating him up as much as we could and you know how that goes. Because the original, and I can't say it because I'm far too well educated, but me and I can't. <laughs> you know, it's a job I have to do. Is uh, no sean pendejos. <laughs> Go to college and graduate. That's, yes. that's the message. And I'll leave the last slide. So, just as a point of information, in 2008, an evaluation study was conducted to check the effects of this conference. It's a long weekend experience for students who are usually in their junior year, and um, it had occurred for 40 years at that time, and it hadn't really been formally evaluated. The mission of the conference is to get Chicano Latino high school students to go to college and graduate through cultural relevance um, and pride. And this is what ticked Mr. Castro off to no end, that approximately 52% of Latino um, Chicano Latino students actually do not graduate from high school. And of those who do, 10% go on and finish college. Um, and the numbers vary depending on what research report you read, but that's a good um, average number. And so Mr. Castro would say, we need to get the kids who would go, they qualify or they're very close to qualifying, but they don't know they do, and they don't know what to do to to get there, and that's what the conference was built for. So what we did was to take boxes, because everything was done in boxes, and take four years of boxes and go back as many years as we could to identify students within the range of college graduation and make calls. 2,000 calls were made, hence the picture. <laughs> and of those, 573 picked up the phone. Dang the fact that LA changed zip code from 213 to 323 messed us up. So I'm sure we would have had more responses, but that's a huge um, uh, end size for a survey like this. And the questions were primarily, what happened with college after the conference? Did you go? Didn't you go? Did you finish? What happened? And secondly, what influenced you in whatever direction? So we have some findings. Do you want to see them? Sure. Yeah. There we go. Well, the first thing we wanted to do was to have a baseline. So compared to what? So we looked for other high school students equivalent. We couldn't find a comparable group statistically. So the best we could do was to find 
the percentage of already admitted, uh, matriculated university Latino Chicano students in the nation. So that would be some of you here. So imagine that's the group of the Latino Chicano freshmen who are already admitted, started college, what percentage of them graduate college? So here's a group of 10. So count with me the group of 10s, so we'll say 10, 20, 30, of college freshmen who are Chicano Latino who actually graduate from college in the country. Ready? 10, 20, 20 30, 30, 40. Don't keep counting. That's it. So out of 100 students who start college as freshmen, Chicano Latino students, 40% graduate. So you think about your classes here. Look around and count. Yes, 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 yes. No, 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 six times. Yes, 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 yes. No, 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 six times. So we use that as the comparison group because we don't have a comfort, comparable group. So should we see the college graduation rate of these high school kids? Those kids right here. Ready? So remind you, they're not in high college yet. They haven't even applied yet. They haven't gotten accepted. They haven't begun. So this is predicting their ultimate completion within five years of a BA degree. 10, 10 20, 20, a little bit louder, please. 30. 30. 40, so now we're even, 50, 60, 70, 80, 84. 84% 84 of any student who attended the conference in their junior year mostly end up fast forwarding their junior, senior, five more years getting a BA. Thank you very much. is held almost every year until the year 2008 when funding, you know, the, did you notice there was a funding crisis back then? And the money dried up and prior to that, about 300 students a year, every year, 40 years almost, attended the conference. That's how many college graduates more we had since 2008, not one conference. Um, that's very, very sad finding. So now, what we're going to do is pop quiz you. Are you ready? So you knowing that this is the end, and then we get to eat. Um, <laughs> almost, 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 sorry. Um, <coughs> there, if you know Mr. Castro, now I hope you have a spirit of Mr. Castro. He's in the room. He's still giving us assignments. We're here. We're here. <laughs> He's still um, giving us our homework. Um, so here's a quiz. Try and guess the answer to these. Ready? Pop quiz. Quinceañeras <laughs> are a rich cultural event. True or false? The answer is heck no. Why? What a waste of money. <laughs> <laughs> and you could use that money for college. <laughs> and what are you celebrating? Coming out at 50? Really? Yeah. Who does that anymore? <laughs> okay, you ready? Next one. So, girls. Talking to the girls. What are high school guys good for? Think, think on your own. Share with a neighbor. <laughs> Answer? All of the above. All of the above. <laughs> and he would talk like that to us in class, believe me. Okay, next one, ready? Sentence completion. Everybody read it aloud with us. Ready, set, go. Go to college and graduate. Oh, you were listening. You were listening. Very nice. Very nice. And that's the revised version. Okay, so now, here we go. So now this one Mirna has to do because I just can't. No. She, you know, she gets very nervous about this. Go. Um, by the way, I do too. I just, somebody has to do it. Okay, so if you didn't go to college, um, and you were, you know, you, yes. And, oh and so you, Mr. Castro would make sure that you were going to be in this particular group, which is called the MRP, Muy Rete Que Pendejo Club. <laughs> <laughs> and a way of getting into the club was exactly that, not completing school. So we have a few of his um, definitions, definitions of 
So here, these oh, are the I'm matches. Sorry, Mark. Uh, Ready? Right. Sorry. First one. The first one is pendejo optimista. <laughs> Go ahead. Definition. Cree que no es pendejo. <laughs> to attend the CYLC conference. Uh, I was at Roosevelt High School, and I graduated in 1965, uh, but my friend, Don Nakanishi, <laughs> did go <laughs> from Roosevelt High School. Uh, and, and Don retired a few years ago. He was director of the Asian American Studies Center here at wow, UCLA. Uh, when, you, when you look at, at the display case, there is a bag, a tote bag on wheels. Uh, that was the bag that uh, Mr. Castro took wherever he was making a presentation. And all of the items that are out there uh, on display, the smaller items were, he would take them out one at a time and then mm -hmm. talk about them and talk about what they meant to you and to your education. And he usually talked to high school level students, sometimes to college level, because he was invited to every every university up and down the state of California, as far east as Notre Dame, and so on. And wherever he went, he took the, the, the school colors with him. So if he came to UCLA, he had a tie. It was uh, blue and gold. If he went to Notre Dame, he wore their colors, and so on. So uh, we visited his, his place, and this man was a clothes hound. He had ties that took up an entire, an entire room. Uh, oh, it, it's it's a fascinating, um, well, it's fascinating to me <laughs> that he could afford all those times. <laughs> uh, yeah. <it's> <laughs> uh, in addition, there's artwork here. Uh, there's some artwork out there. Uh, one of the artists that has been truly involved in the CYLC throughout is Ignacio Gomez. He's here with us today. Ignacio, yeah. why don't you stand up? Yeah, yeah. The uh, CYLC paintings, the prints, the uh, conference uh, poster that we had here in 2006 for the conference that we had on Mr. Castro and the CYLC here at UCLA in 2006, he created the poster. That's the black and white poster that's outside. And there's other uh, artwork, the 40th anniversary poster, the 45th anniversary poster, Ignacio did that. Uh, now, uh, we have a very important person to speak. And that's the person that's carrying forward with the wishes of Sal Castro. She's making sure that what he said in the hospital and at home in his final days is, 
being implemented. And, that is, and this is the woman that spent over 40 years, 45 years, uh, with, uh, with Sal as uh, his compañera. I want to invite her here, Charlotte. I'm walking in front so I won't trip. My name is Charlotte Lurch and Muller. Good, Good afternoon. I need to introduce and reintroduce myself to you. I'm Sal Castro's widow. Today marks the opening of the Sal Castro exhibit, which gives you a tip of the iceberg known as Sal Castro. It also marks six months to the day of his passing. Here today from our family is number two son, Jimmy Castro. Selena, I'm sure, is on her way along with the daughter-in-law with two grandsons, um, James and Michael. Number one son, Gil, had a major work conflict, and I've got a text from Emily Scheid, his lady, coming, still trying to get there, been <laughs> on the road for an hour. <laughs> Soon after Sal died, I told Carlos Otto that Sal requested that his papers, his stuff, go to UCLA. Here we are with the beginnings of this humongous project. Carlos and Lisette Guerra started the project, and for this we are grateful. The opening and the program is a joint effort of Carlos and Lisette, along with Robin Avilar LaSalle and Mirna Bruti, the two people that Sal wanted to continue with the CYLC directorship. You will see what all have done to keep the legacy of Sal Castro alive and moving forward by today's activities. I want to give special recognition to Araceli Lopez with her amazing abilities to keep the CYLC family together and supporting the Sal Castro legacy. <laughs> the trio de colores made up of the Morasa family traveled from Ventura to add to, the, to today's events. And you will see and have seen why they were so special to Sal. I've spoken about Sal Castro's legacy. The Sal Castro Foundation is the major way in which his legacy will continue and move forward. We are moving closer to the ability to function with a nonprofit 5013C status. In the next week or so, important news concerning the mission, beliefs, and strategic goals will be released. Bear with us as we move forward. We want to dot every I and cross every T. The top priority of the Sal Castro Foundation <coughs> is and will continue to be the Chicano Youth Leadership Conference as that is Sal's legacy. Thank you to Mario Garcia for his commitment with his generous contribution to the Sal Castro Foundation from the sale of the Sal Castro tapes. There is a Sal Castro ofrenda at the Avenue 50 studio. Mita Cuaron and Maria Villamil put their hearts and souls into this, and I urge you to share in their outpouring of love. Next Friday, October 25th, is Sal's birthday, his 80th. Our family is having a memorial mass. And let me take a deep breath. 
at our Mother of Good Counsel Church at 9 a.m. We invite you. We will be help hosting coffee and pan dulce afterwards at our house. Now I feel it's necessary to say something that I'm going to say after what I have seen since Sal became ill. My only purpose and my only job for the rest of my life are to keep Sal Castro's legacy alive and moving forward. I will protect his memory and legacy from charlatans who falsely present themselves using Sal's memory for their personal gain or who want to hijack his memory and accomplishments to further themselves at his expense or for their personal gain. God help anyone who steps in my way. <laughs> Please believe me. I've been reading many of the speeches and presentations that Sal has done over the years. I will end with what he would say. Muchísimas gracias. Que Dios los bendiga y que la Virgen Morena siempre los proteja. Thank you for being here. Now we're going to have the group come together. You're going to lead us to the food. Before we leave, though, I'd like for, for Carmen to sing a song that, that we first, she first sang, she wrote for Sal uh, when the, uh, when we had the, the, uh, the dedication of the, uh, the school, middle school. Well, so we voted at the conference. Let me get my guitar. We wanted him to conference because when we got there, he got to go up on stage. It was an amazing moment because he came up on stage and he and he got to speak the last line at the conference. And that's where we wrote it right before the conference, and then we got to sing it at, at the dedication. So it was a, a, a really exciting moment. Sorry to correct my book. <laughs> well, and the reason why, and, and uh, I didn't mean to uh, deviate from the program, and I apologize. It's just that it's, um, I think it's, it's very a appropriate for, you know, to kind of put in perspective what was said uh, very eloquently with your presentation and Charlie, what you just finished. And um, so, without further ado, I'm sorry, it. I didn't bring my printed copy, so I. Mm -hmm. it is. There it and is. What, what It's called uh, Temblor del 1968. El temblor del 1968. Marzo del 68. East LA Temblor. Con fuerza se despertó Más de dos mil estudiantes Se unieron con fuerte voz ¡Viva la raza! ¡Chicano Power! ¡Ahora nos van a escuchar! ¡Somos mexicanos, pero americanos! ¡Con nuestros derechos vamos a marchar! Todo esto ocurrió Cansados por la injusticia y la discriminación Se enfrentaron al sistema llenos de orgullo y valor Somos chicanos, viva la raza, ahora nos van a escuchar Somos mexicanos, pero americanos, por nuestros derechos vamos a marchar. Sao Castro los impulsaba 
que vieran su realidad. Ignora nuestros esfuerzos, él les decía la verdad. Nuestros logros también cuentan, es tiempo de organizar. Chicano Power, viva la raza, ahora nos van a escuchar. Somos mexicanos, pero americanos, por nuestros derechos vamos a marchar. Muchas cosas han cambiado, but the continúa. Hay que seguir educando, hay que seguir educando, para no volver atrás los golpes que recibieron y el sacrificio que hicieron no se debe olvidar Chicano Power digamos todos con gusto y con valor no somos menos en todo el contrario lo dijo Castro. ¿Qué dijo Sao Castro, Carmelita? It's great to be chicano. Viva la raza, chicano power. Ahora nos van a escuchar. Somos mexicanos, pero americanos por nuestros derechos. Vamos a pelear. We're all going to sing the colors, okay? I want to take Oh, 